The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Tonight's talk is about self and selfie, selfies, and there is no better person to give this talk other than Ajahn, especially when millions of people want to take selfies with him. Yes. So Ajahn, over to you. I still cannot understand that. Why people want to take photographs of old fat monks. <laughs> and it's also, just before I came in here, one hour of signing books and taking selfies, and I still manage to smile all the time. You know why? And that is because I train. That's one of the trainings a monk has to do these days. Not just how to meditate, not just how to keep precepts, but also how to smile. So every morning I do my 10 push-ups. <laughs> to train my smiling uh, muscles. Because what are exercise and push-ups supposed to do for you? is to make you healthy. But sometimes if you're running, or if you're doing other types of push-ups, or you're doing weightlifting, what does that really do? That trains your body. But being able to train your mind in happiness, it was something my first meditation teacher taught me. Because when I went to a meditation lesson with him, he said, my name at that time, my lay name was Peter. He said, Peter, why are you just got such an ugly face? I wouldn't take that from most people, but if it's like someone teaching you meditation, you'd accept that. Why have you got an ugly face? You should smile some more. So he told me, when I get up every morning, he said, what's the first thing you do? I say, I go to the toilet. And he said, in your toilet, is there a mirror? Yeah. Well, look at yourself in the mirror and smile. At this time, I was about 18 or 19, a young student, and I said, Sir, I'd be afraid to look at my face in the morning in the mirror. <laughs> You've been up all night partying or out with your girlfriend or something. I'll be afraid. He said, No, look at your face in the mirror. And if you can't manage a real smile, just get your two fingers and push up. Come on. Try it. <laughs> and if you did that in front of a mirror, you would actually start laughing. You're already laughing already. And imagine starting every day, no matter how you felt, no matter what was in front of you, with a smile on your face. And that worked from the very first day and I continued doing that exercise, looking at my face in the mirror and smiling at myself for two years without missing any morning. And I did that and I could see the results of it. I was much more handsome when I smiled and when I... <laughs> and happier and more successful with whatever you did in life with a smile. And because of that, I learned how to teach that to others even on deep things like meditating. If you can smile when you start meditating, that's the best posture. I've heard many, many people teaching how you must sit when you do your meditation. The left foot over the right foot, left hand over the right, back straight, chin down, closed eyes. There's so many different postures and none of those positions are really important as the smile. If you could smile when you started meditating, you get some much deeper meditation. It's a simple thing, but it actually works. If you smile when you're reading a book, you have to learn something for your university, your trade. If you smile, you do much, much better. If you're in the police force, and you have to arrest somebody. If you smile when you're arresting them. <laughs> that was certainly disturbed to think, what's going on here? Being arrested by a smiling policeman. 
it brings to mind one of the words. When you do something which is original, like smiling when you're arresting someone in the police force, we call it, we discombobulate that person. Have you ever heard the English word discombobulate before? As it sounds, so it means. It means you're totally confused and they don't know what's going on. And it's one of my favorite words, because it's a beautiful word to say. Okay, try it now. Discombobulate. <laughs> so what that does, it creates a more sense of happiness and life in whatever you're doing. And so because of that, I don't find it difficult to smile when I'm having my photograph taken. And I think that may be one of the reasons why people actually don't mind taking a selfie with me. Simply because they know I'd always get that smile on my face. Imagine that when you ask for a selfie, when I uh, signed your book, I went... Mm. Actually, no, I'm, I honestly was trying to do an ugly face. It's really hard to do. I think I need to take some lessons on how to to put a miserable face on my on my countenance. Is that any good? No, not really. And this is really quite strange because this is telling you that underneath all of this, it's not just a fake smile. I've been putting this smile on my face for such a long time, it's actually real. It comes from a sense of joy and happiness. Even when I have to smile, it, it's natural, it's fun. It brings joy into whatever I'm doing. Even my signatures you've seen on the books, I always put a smiley face on those. And that's a bit of a problem for me because every now and again, you have to sign something on a government form. <laughs> and if I don't <laughs> mind what I'm doing, I put a smiley face on that as well and they say, you can't accept that. Anyway, never mind. So when you put, <laughs> put that smiley face on you, it makes life much easier, no matter what you ever have to do in life. If you go to face the boss because there's some difficulty in your company or something, if you put a smile on your face when you go and see the boss, what would your boss think? They think she's up to something, she's up to something, <laughs> or whatever. But it does discombobulate people. It puts you in charge of the situation, no matter what you're ever doing. And so it's one part of the, the countenance on my face which has huge amounts of positive, um, positive effects. Even, we were mentioning like what um, sport did I represent Cambridge at against Oxford when I was a student there. One sport which I did do was rowing, but that was just for fun, it was got too serious. But I do remember one occasion we were in a race, you know, these, these uh, uh, what they call the eights. So you had eight rowers and a cox in the front. And that was really, really hard work. Some people took that too seriously, as far as I was concerned, but I was trying my best in the team, rowing as fast as I could. And that's also when the coach shouted out at me and said, you're making an ugly face, smile. And one thing which I've always been open to is you know, to suggestions and especially to advice, especially when I was young, I just wanted to experiment with things. I was a scientist, a physicist. And so I decided to smile instead of frowning when you're trying to pull this oar as hard as you could in a race. And as soon as I started to smile, I discovered two things. One, it never hurt as much to pull that oar and you had more energy, you could pull it harder. And I couldn't believe just how a smile on your face affected your body and you had more energy immediately. And it kind of shocked me, but it was true. And so whatever you have to do in your life, anything which is really an exertion for you, please put a smile on your face, it makes it much easier. Even for all you women who are maybe pregnant, when you're having a kid and you go through the labor pains, you think, what's he talking about now? What does he know about this? <laughs> <laughs> the one nice thing about being a Buddhist monk, you've had previous lives. <laughs> so it's true I haven't had any babies in this life. <laughs>
But instead of grimacing when you're going through your labors, uh, energies, smile. <laughs> Why not? Seriously. You find you make that relaxation happen. So by having selfies done of me so often, you do learn a lot. And you can make it more uh, positive. And this is one of the reasons I think that people like to take selfies of me, because it's a happy face. And sometimes I take the ordinary happy face, please smile, and take it even further. <laughs> They're making faces. You know sometimes that people are afraid to smile or make funny faces because they feel that they're embarrassed. There's one nice thing about being a monk, you don't get embarrassed. Because either way, I have a positive outcome. If I smile you know, a bit over much and it works, then that's wonderful, people are very happy. If I smile and it's a stupid smile, then people will leave me alone. Either way, as a monk, I win. I can either be more hermetic and get more rest. This is one of the reasons why I was telling the person who drove me here this evening. And I was saying that I don't mind being late to these appointments, such as public talks, because the later I arrive here, the less books I have to sign, the more I can relax, the less I have to talk. <laughs> you can see, you can always see the positive side in anything. So that's one of the reasons why, when you learn to smile, it's showing like a positive attitude to anything you do in life. But I should put a limitation on that. I often say you should be positive, but except for one thing. There's one thing in life you should always be negative, and that's with COVID tests. <laughs> okay, I think I said this story and the first day I came here, what's the best blood type to keep you the healthiest? B positive. Has anybody got B positive plus uh, blood type here? Yay! B positive, B positive. See how happy they are and how successful? The head of the, uh, the uh, city zen and the great builder, sometimes People feel that all the money we spend raising funds to build these, um, these places like our retreat center. And often, you know, whenever I come here, where's Ajahn Mudito? He's talking to the builder. He doesn't get paid for this, he just really works hard, making sure everything is done appropriately and done well. And it's amazing. What was your job before you became a monk, Ajahn Mudito? In construction, as a builder. What was my job before I became a monk? And don't say stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was a theoretical physicist. So anyway, <laughs> but you know I was once. One Waysack time, some years ago, here at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, having finished a talk one evening, Afterwards, before people actually all left, this one young man came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, he said, you know, I'm a Sri Lankan, and he was actually working at the Melbourne Comedy Club and also uh, on one of the comedy shows on TV. And he said, I was listening to you. Your timing is perfect. Your material is original. I think I can get you a job. <laughs> <laughs> and he offered me a job as a stand-up comedian at the Melbourne Comedy Club. <laughs> of course, I never dismiss anything out of hand, but I thought about it and said, mm, I think I'll keep my, my ordinary J job. So I never took the... Was that a good, good choice? Of course it is, because... Uh, it's nice to be able to share comedy, to share happy moments and wonderful stories. Just like with selfies. Sometimes a selfie is good or selfie is bad. And what's the answer there? A member wrote a book about this. Good, bad? Who knows? Yeah. has two parts to it. And sometimes because of selfies, I've... 
a couple of times I've come that close to missing flights. The last time was I was transiting in Changi Airport in Singapore and as I uh, was walking through the terminal, I go to so many terminals these days on those, all these flights, I'm really in danger of terminal illness. <laughs> okay, that's a terrible joke, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but anyhow, that I was just walking, minding my business, and in this particular time, it was the Indonesians. There was a big plane of Indonesians that uh, just come back from pilgrimage to India, and they were transiting in Changi Airport before flying off to Jakarta to go home. And so they were all really energized and excited, and they saw me and said, Ajahn Brahm! I said, yeah, can we have a selfie? That was about 40 or 30 or 40 Indonesians. And I thought a selfie meant just one shot. <laughs> was it one shot? No way. That individuals and then with their friend and with their family and with other family members and then all together and with this group and that group. And this was no exaggeration. I said, look, I've got a plane to catch. Oh, just one more, just one more. <laughs> and then by the time I got to the gate, they were calling out my name. <laughs> I came that close to missing the flight. But anyway, it was good fun. They gave me a nice story. If I miss the flight, it doesn't matter. There's always another flight, if I can get on it. But anyway, one of the other times, taking selfies and asking questions, as monks, we're always, you know, very respectful, as best we possibly can. There's many, many people, so we can't give you know, all the time to just one person. But you always try your very best. If someone wants to ask a question, you want to give an answer. Uh, so this particular time, this was in Hong Kong. And it was in, I think, the Polytech University. It's a very big um, uh, hall they hired, maybe about two or 3,000 people. So, you know, these are big gigs. And then after the talk, question time. And after the question time of the, you know, the people putting their hand up, then people come up to get their books signed, to take selfies and ask their ordinary questions. And they never realize a Buddhist monk is still a human being. And we also need to go to toilet. And I was bursting. <laughs> it's very good that we got a lot of restraint as a monk. But nevertheless, by the time I got down from the stage and walked to the, the door, I was stopped so many times. And then as you walk through the, the antechambers, kept on being stopped for f selfies. I don't know what I look like. <laughs> At least they were only taking a selfie of me from here up to my head. They weren't noticing I was crossing my legs for everything I was worth. <laughs> but then finally, after about an hour, you know, struggling from the stage to the toilet, the men's toilet, as soon as I went in there, I thought, ah, oh. it's almost, it's not quite as good as Nibbana, but you know, up there somewhere, <laughs> the relief. <laughs> from the affliction of a bursting bladder. <laughs> and I was just going to go into one of the empty cubicles. And this young man turned around and said, Oh, Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> can I ask you a question on meditation? <laughs> At least he never took a selfie in the toilet. But you do the best you can and just answer the question as best you can because other people were important to you. That's one of the reasons why, one of the philosophies which I hope all of you who have known me have learned and follow are the Emperor's Three Questions. And it's a brilliant sort of anecdote. I read this again when I was a student at university. You know, in those days, being a student, even at a, you know, a very difficult course at a top university, 
you still had plenty of time, plenty of time to enjoy your youth and go to parties, to do things like uh, join the Buddhist Society of Cambridge University, to join other societies. This was your social life, the time you were growing up. And I think it's very cruel for young people to have to go to university and do nothing but study their one tiny subject. We were even invited, encouraged to go to other lecturers. They had some of the best minds you know, in the whole country at Cambridge University. And you can go and listen to these lectures of these very, very famous people in subjects you didn't know about. So you were really expanding your education, which was amazing. But anyway, just you know, while I was there, I learned so much about so many different things. And there was one thing which I always loved, still love to this day, was Russian literature. You know, some of those the Russian authors, you know, Dostoevsky, and uh, obviously Tolstoy and Chekhov, these were brilliant, just the way they could get words together and, dis and describe scenery and, and situations, you know, from that time. I'd love that stuff. And I remember just getting a book out of the library uh, of this, uh, it was a compendium of many different authors. And it was to raise money to assist the Jewish community in Russia at that time, who were being discriminated against. And somebody you know, with their friends did all these wonderful short stories, put them in a book, and all the proceeds were to help the Jewish community in Russia, in Imperial Russia at the time. And then one of those stories I will never forget was written by Leo Tolstoy. And it was entitled The Emperor's Three Questions. And that's such a powerful story. And I've used that in my life as a Buddhist monk. Whenever I come here to give talks or to sign books or whatever I do, wherever that happens to be, but also in meditation as well, you adapt it. And it's a brilliant little uh, method. The Emperor's Three Questions. I'm sure many of you must remember this. I was also going to say that when I did go to Hong Kong, there was some Thai people who used to work for Cathay Pacific and I used to go and give talks every year at the airline and also uh, the Human Resources Department came to listen to one of those talks. They liked it so much they actually uh, included this Empress Three Questions method in their training for all of their staff, not just the uh, cabin crew, but for the people you know on the desk when you check in, for everybody. And it was required, the emperor's three questions. One of the reasons why I hesitate to say that is because Cathay Pacific, Cathay Pacific went quite downhill after they started including, <laughs> including that method. I don't think it was because of that method, because of the COVID time and the economic time was very difficult for everybody. But nevertheless, that was part of the training for, for everybody. Those Emperor's Three Questions, now to tell you what they are, was when is the most important time? Who is the most important person? And what is the most important thing to do? Three questions. And the reason why is the Emperor's Three Questions, the Emperor had it up to here with religion. Have you ever noticed that? Religious people always argue. Not Buddhists, of course. Not members of the Buddhist Society of Victoria. <laughs> but it's well known that people, especially these are important questions of life, they want to make their own answers. And they want to find some advice from others. It's one of the things which, those of you who have known me for a time, I don't tell you what to believe. The Buddha never told you what to believe. Well, he actually kind of did. But more importantly, told you how to find out. That's the Buddhist Eightfold Path. To be restrained, to be virtuous, to meditate, and also not just to trust what you've been taught by others. That's why that one of the sayings which I've said, never allow your knowledge to stand in the way of truth. Sometimes you've got to see something right in front of you, it's clear to you, and your mind is very, very precise. 
not by intellectual power, but by clarity and stillness, meditative power. And then sometimes you see things which you don't really, it's not what you've been taught. It's something much better, much deeper, much more profound. And that happens even in one's meditation practice. Even in Buddhism, you learn to see much more deeply some of the most powerful understandings of life. I'm going a bit off subject here, but here we go. Like, who decided to come here this evening? Did you decide to come here? Or was this all conditioned into you? How much free will do you really have? And how much is programmed into you by what you've seen, what you look on the, uh, the internet, by how you've been trained, who you've spoken to, who you associate with. One of the other things which I joined at Cambridge was the Society for Psychic Research. And part of that was studies in hypnosis. Hypnosis is an interesting part of Buddhism, of Buddhism. There's a way that people can access the mind. Why people may have lost memory and they cannot access that memory through the brain, but they can access it through the mind. I'm talking about memory of a long time ago, even memory of your previous life. Now, being a Buddhist monk of so many years, you've seen this actually happening. And it's real, it's actually true. And that's the weird thing, when you see it for yourself, you have no doubt about this anymore. About what the mind is, and what the brain is. Two different objects, two different things. So, but anyway, things like this start to challenge you. Through hypnosis, Remember this experiment which was done, and I was witnessing it. They asked for a few students to come up who were volunteered to be hypnotized. Of course, I was courageous enough. I went up there, but I was not a good hypnotic subject. But there's always two or three were really easy to hypnotize. And one of these young men, they were hypnotized in front of us all. They did some stupid things, we all laughed. But the most important lesson I learned from this was when the hypnotist told one of these students under hypnosis that when he touched his right earlobe, this student would stand up and sing the British National Anthem in a loud voice. And he said, I'm now gonna take you out of hypnosis you won't remember the instructions you know, that I told you to do this, but when I touch my right earlobe, you'll stand up and sing the British National Anthem from beginning to end. He took him out of hypnosis. And of course, this hypnotist was a great entertainer. Every now and again, he'd move his finger close to his, but then he'd scratch his cheek instead, just to wind everybody up. But eventually, he did that. The hypnotist touched his right earlobe. And this young student stood up in a hall like this, stood up and sang from beginning to end, God save the Queen, in a really loud voice. Now students weren't royalists, we were all leftists probably, and I'm not sure why he did that, but he did that and we were laughing at him, we were almost kidding ourselves laughing. What a stupid thing to do. How stupid would that be if one of you decided to do that right now? <laughs> no, I don't hypnotize you. But nevertheless, that's what happened. He sang from beginning to end, even though we were almost wetting our pants, literally, you know, because we were laughing so much. But then, after he had finished, the hypnotist asked him, why did you do that? And this young student gave a credible answer. To him, it was really clear 
that he had decided freely to sing the British National Anthem. To each one of us, it was an impossibility. But for him, it was no different than his free choice. So each one of you, why did you come here today? Why do you make donations? I will tell you why. There was this monk who was just starting up a new temple somewhere. And he was building a nice meditation retreat center and in fact a lot of difficulty raising enough funds to actually to complete it. So he went to see another old monk and fat monk. <laughs> and that old and fat monk told him how to raise money really easily. He said, when you give a talk, give a boring talk. Close all the windows. Turn up the heat. And then when you find that most people in the audience are getting sleepy, then take out, say, your watch, swing it backwards and forwards. You're feeling sleepy. You're feeling, and just before they get hypnotized, actually just after they get hypnotized, before they fall asleep, say, in the donation box, no coins, no fives, no tens, no twenties, only fifties and hundreds. <laughs> and a young monk said, I can't do that. That's cheating, that's fraud. He said, no, it's good karma. <laughs> It's encouraging people to make good merit. So he tried it, and it worked. That day he made a lot of money, enough to pay the bills two or three times over. But he was smart enough not to try that every week. When he needed some money again, he closed all the windows, turned up the heater, gave a really boring talk, and when everyone's about to be ready to be hypnotized, he got the watch out and he started swinging it. You know what happened next? He dropped the watch <laughs> and it smashed on the floor. And the monk just automatically, showing no restraint, said, oh shit. <laughs> and that's what everybody in the audience did. <laughs> <laughs> so don't try that, Adrian. <laughs> 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 but sometimes when we have something like the nature of the will, why do you do what you do? Why did you become monks? You two monks in the front there. Yeah, my fault, yeah. You came and listened to one of my talks. <laughs> You will become a monk. <laughs> no, but some of this stuff, it stretches your beliefs. You think you are in control. But as you go deeper into what self and selfies are, you, know, you find a lot of time you don't have much choice. What does that mean? It means that when you make a mistake, it's not my fault. If I said the S-H-I-T word, it's not my, my fault. Can I say that in, in uh, Victoria? Are you going to ban me? From that? <laughs> no. This is one thing which is, whenever you start delving deep into the nature of truth, sometimes it can challenge you. As I say, the Emperor's Three Questions, I should get back to that before I get myself sidetracked. Now is the most important time. Who is the most important person? Uh, many of you know this answer because I tell this story often and it's in the books which I write. But when I first heard that answer, who is the most important person in the world? I wasn't a theist, so I could not say a god or some religious leader or not a Nelson Mandela or a, uh, you know, any sort of hero 
not a Jimi Hendrix, which I like very much. That was, I thought maybe it was really, I liked him a lot, but not the most important person in the world. The answer, so the next thing I thought, the most important person in the world would be oneself. And that was also the wrong answer. The answer which I read was something which did really rock me, changed the way I looked at life. The most important person in the world is not yourself or any other being. It's a person who's right in front of you in this moment right now, whoever that happens to be. That's a brilliant answer because what that meant was if somebody comes up to me and they want to take a selfie, I don't care who you are, you want to do it, you're the most important person in the whole world to me. And I will give you that energy and that time and that importance no matter who you are. When you give importance to the person right in front of you, that's how in the hospitality industry, actually in any industry, that's how you connect with a person. Honestly, how many of you, you go to talk to somebody and you feel they're trying to get rid of you? You're, they're not giving importance to you at all. And that could be your husband, could be your wife, could be your father. They're too busy to give importance to you. That story, uh, please excuse me for telling stories, but they're really meaningful. We've got Mother's Day coming in uh, Melbourne next Sunday, isn't it? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, Sunday. Okay, so I do. I remember telling this story to when I was visiting um, one of the islands of uh, Indonesia many years ago, and this was to a Muslim lady, you know, on the radio. They wanted to interview me, and this story made her not just cry, made her weep. And I just suddenly, I'd, I'd, I'd hit a button there on her. The story was about this son who was waiting for his daddy to come home from work. And when his daddy arrived back from work, he said, Daddy, Daddy, welcome. Um, how much do you earn at the office every hour? Now you may have come home from work one evening and you love your children, but being asked a silly question like that, what's your reaction? So the dad said, look, it's none of your business. Be quiet, I'm tired. But daddy, how much do you earn every hour at work? Look, I told you, be quiet, I'm tired. But daddy, how many dollars do you earn? Look, I told you three times, that's it, you're grounded. The daddy was very angry at the son for not listening to what he was supposed to do. So the son went back, went up to his bedroom and after the father had a cup of tea and relaxed a little bit, I think many of you who have got kids know what it feels like, you've done something wrong to your kid. He felt so guilty, he went up to his son's bedroom, knocked quietly on the door, opened the door and let himself in and said, son, look, I'm sorry that I shouted at you. I do not know why you want to know how much I earn at work. But the answer is $20 an hour. Now please excuse me if that's not meaningful in today's world. This is a story from quite a long time ago. $20 an hour, he said. So the son smiled, thank you, Daddy. Now, Daddy, can I please borrow $10? <laughs> and now the Daddy, the father, would usually say no. But he'd upset his son once that evening, he didn't want to upset his son again. So he took out his wallet and took out a $10 note and gave it to his son. Thank you, Daddy. And then the little boy opened a drawer next to his bed and had another ten dollars in coin, coins, counted out twenty bucks, and gave it to his father, and said, now daddy, can I please have 
one hour of your time. <laughs> and at that, this Muslim lady, she burst into tears. She explained afterwards, she was a single mum. She was working so hard, trying to get enough money to look after her kid. And she was working her guts out. But she, she realized what her kid wants most of all is not the money or toys or a good education. Wants a time with the mummy. Because of that, very often, it's the person right in front of us we can ignore too easily. And that can be our own kid. Please never forget when your kid is right in front of you and it asks you again and again, Mummy, 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 Daddy, Daddy. Please know they're the most important person in the world. Okay, so that's the first two questions. Now is the most important time. The one in front of you is the most important person in the whole world. Last thing, what's the most important thing to do? And that's always to care. Doesn't be specific how you care, but just that feeling that you just want to love and care and help and serve. And if I've uh, been a successful teacher or friend to any of you, it is because of those qualities. Now, if I'm with you, it doesn't matter how tired I am, how many books I've already signed, how many smiles, selfies I've already done. Now is the only time in the world. If you're right in front of me with your camera or standing next to me and somebody else is smiling, or is taking a camera shot, then that's the most important thing in the whole world for me. And the most important thing to do is to care, to make it sure it's a beautiful photograph for you. And that's being honest with you. Sometimes I fail at that, but I really try all the best I possibly can to be able to do that for you. And that's also one of the reasons why I, I don't mind going to some places where monks don't usually go. I remember just the memory comes up of just going on the public transport, especially over in UK, because I know the, uh, the underground system so well, because I grew up over there. So even now, when I'm a monk, if at all possible, I'd prefer to take an underground train and be driven in some big car from one place to another. It takes a lot of arguments sometimes to ask the people. They said, no, we can't let you go on the underground. I said, please, I want to go on the underground. They said, no, we've got a nice car to take you, but please, let me go on the underground. And the reason is because you can meet more people. They can see a monk on the underground. You have some amazing results. There was this one time when I was just minding my own business on the underground as a monk, and this lady came and sat right next to me. The, the carriage was pretty full, but she still sat next to me, looked at me and said, are you a Buddhist monk? I said, yeah, a real one. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So she always wanted to you know, find out a little bit about Buddhism. So we spent maybe 10 minutes from many stations talking about different parts of Buddhism. And then eventually we came onto the subject of reincarnation, rebirth. And then she said, what actually is rebirth? So I told her a story which had happened only a couple of months before when I was in Australia teaching a meditation retreat. And one of the people on that retreat he was an a Italian man, living in Australia, but Italian by birth. And he told me some weird experiences he had through meditation. He said one day he was meditating and he got this, this feeling, almost like a vision, that in a previous life, that he was a, um, a strand of spaghetti. Now, I don't laugh too much because sometimes people have some weird experiences in meditation. And the next day, he had this almost convincing realization that he was a piece of macaroni. <laughs> and he asked me what it meant. And it took me a minute or so to get the answer. Now, the insight came up very clearly to me. He was an Italian man. He was recollecting 
his pastor lives. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if <laughs> if any of you have ever sat in the London underground in the morning, nobody gets eye contact with you. Nobody says anything. They're either looking at a newspaper or looking at an iPhone. They just totally um, separated from one another. But as soon as I cracked that punchline, there was a lot of laughter. I must admit there was a few groans as well. <laughs> but they all looked at me. And you got the understanding that was a wonderful way of presenting Buddhism to people who just wouldn't know about it otherwise. You know, teaching about rebirth in a funny way and noticing that religion can have a wonderful sense of humor. So I thought that was a wonderful success to get the attention of a whole carriage load of people uh, in the underground. That's one of the reasons why I love doing that. So anyway, uh, now the most important time. The one in front of you is the most important person in the whole world. And the most important thing to do is to care. To be kind, to have this wonderful loving kindness. And it's amazing just what that can actually do. So because you know, I practice that when you take photographs of me, I think that means there's more photographs taken. But it's not just a photograph which you take. It's that just experience with a monk who can smile and can give you those moments, even though I am incredibly busy. But the moment is more important than anything else in the whole world. What I did want actually to say about <laughs> selfies is even a selfie is nice, but you cannot capture truth in a photograph. I've learned that so often. You know, once I went over to um, to India on my so when I was about 20 years of age, I went there because I thought, that's, I'm a Buddhist, you should go over there and see some of the holy sites. But I also wanted to see the Himalaya mountains. I'd seen photographs of them, and it was one of those things I just wanted to do, to experience you know, the beautiful breadth of the Himalaya mountains from the north of India. And as soon as I got there, I realized I did not do my research. I went there during the monsoon season. Arrived there, I think, in July. So you looked up north, you know, from the plains of India, and all you saw was clouds. And I soon gave up all hope of seeing the Himalaya mountains on that trip. Except one day, being in Kathmandu, and I, my, I heard from other friends in the youth hostel, you could actually go up to um, one of the uh, post office buses and up to the border between uh, Nepal and uh, Tibet. You couldn't cross that border, but at least you could go right up to the border. And it was a very cheap, uh, it was actually illegal. The guy who drove the bus, it was just a bit of extra pocket money for him. But I went up there, and when he stopped for his lunch, very close to the border, there was a hill, and I, together with two other people, they were uh, an American couple, also travelers. We climbed up this hill. When we got to the top, as we got to the top, this is no exaggeration, the clouds parted, and you could see the whole breadth of the Himalaya mountains. Know, from the east to the west. The air was really clear, it was monsoon season, it had all been sort of washed, perfectly clean, and it was a breathtaking sight. So you know what I did? My camera was in the car. <laughs> Honest, that's how stupid I was. I ran down the hill, it took another maybe 20 minutes to run down, maybe 25 minutes to run back up again with the camera to take the shot. And as soon as I got up to the top, the two Americans were sitting there just gaping at the view. And the clouds came in as soon as I got to the top and closed up and I couldn't see the Himalaya mountains again. And they asked, where did you go? Because I wanted to capture that amazing scenery in a photograph. 
I'd missed everything. And to this day, I don't think I hardly ever take any photographs because I'd rather capture the present moment rather than some memory of it in some sort of film or some computer graphic. Real beauty cannot be put in a box, cannot be put in a photograph. All the photographs ever do, they kind of remind you. And sometimes we keep our best photographs in an album. But if you have an album of photographs, what type of photographs do you keep? And what do you delete? I've never, I've gone to people's houses and seen photographs of them when they get married, when they have young kids, you know, when they sort of go on holiday somewhere. I've never ever seen a photograph of a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> I've never ever seen a photograph. I've seen a photograph of people when they graduate from university. I've never seen a, gra a photograph of them of doing their assignments or sitting in a big hall doing their final exams. In the photographs we keep, they're only the happy photographs. The miserable ones, we delete them if we take them at all. And I use that as a simile for your memory. In the photo album of your memory, what do you keep? Why is it, why can't we make our memory, our mind, similar to a good photograph album? Any unpleasant experiences you've had? Delete, 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 delete. And a beautiful experience you've had in life. Save, save, save. You don't have to be burdened by your memories. No more you need to be burdened by the photographs which you keep. Keep only the beautiful photographs which inspire you, which uplift you, which make you feel better and give you hope in this world. Instead of keeping the unpleasant things which happened today, or last week, or earlier in your life. I'm going to give one last anecdote about this. As a monk, Again, you do many, many talks to many different people. This was to the Australian Association of Buddhist Psychologists and Psychotherapists. And I had to give a sort of some idea about how I practice, what I do, especially when people come up and have all their bad experiences of their past. And I said, if you've got bad experiences of your past and you need to let them go, how do you let them go? I'm not quite sure in Melbourne, but how, how um, expensive is it to go and see a counsellor? To see a psychotherapist? They're really expensive. That's why people come and see monks instead. <laughs> We're cheap. <laughs> so I told everybody, this is what you need to do. Instead of going to see <coughs> a psychotherapist or someone, or a psychologist or a counsellor, you always have some bad experiences of your past which you haven't been able to delete from your photo album of your life. So I say, it's important, we all agree on this, the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge what happened. Don't hide it, don't run away from it. To acknowledge it, to give it a sense of truth. So what many people ask you to do is to write it down on a piece of paper. And that's my method as well. Only I have a different type of paper you write it down on. Because many of you have got some very bad memories and traumas and things which have been happened to you which are very difficult to deal with. So. And you're not that ex that expensive, not after giving all these donations to the <laughs> NBM. <laughs> so, to save money, use a roll of toilet paper. There's so many sheets in one roll of toilet paper, 
and use that and write down all the things which you'd love to forget and get rid of and resolve on the roll of toilet paper in brown ink. <laughs> <laughs> When you write it down in dark brown ink, what your, you know, your first wife or your first husband did or what your parents did or what the government did or the teacher did or whatever, write it down in dark brown ink. And of course you get the association with the other thing which you write in, which is dark brown on toilet paper. It doesn't matter how much it is or how little it is, but please remember even if, you, even if you're the, the president of Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Fund, if you've got a tiny piece of toilet paper and it's just got a speck of dark brown on it, how many of you uh, fold it up, put it in your pocket to use it the next time so you don't waste paper? <laughs> Honestly, environment is really important today. How many of you use both sides of the toilet paper? <laughs> You're destroying the planet. <laughs> Even a small bit of brown on the toilet paper, you need to put it in the bowl and flush it away. So you get all these things which have happened to you in your life. You're either responsible for, you're not responsible for, it doesn't matter. And then once you read it all out, you have to do the letting go ceremony. We have shrines for that. They're, co <laughs> They're called toilet cubicles. You take the sheet of toilet paper in dark brown, all the things you'd love to let go of, you take it into the toilet cubicle, you read it out to yourself until you've read it all, and then you do the ceremony. <laughs> you put it in the toilet bowl and press the button. <laughs> and it goes out of your life forever. It's a letting go, a physical act of letting go with the association why you should let it go, dark brown on toilet paper. It's very inexpensive, but please do not do that in the toilets of the Buddhist Society of Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> it'll cost so much, I'm blocking the toilets. <laughs> okay, that sounds funny, but it actually works. As people sometimes say, oh, it's just a joke, Ajahn Brahm says, but no, you can do that. And then you find it's a formal act of, of um, acknowledging it needs to be let go of, and you actually do the letting go in the ceremony. And then you don't have to worry about those things again. Okay, once again, I've over-talked. Uh, uh, have I? Gone over time? Okay, yeah. Okay, which is amazing because I've had a very busy day and busy before this. So anyhow, so now we're going to have some questions. Yeah. Um, so we've got two volunteers going to bring the mic. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yeah, I can Hi, Ajahn. Hi. Nice to have you here. Um, I actually work for the town hall, so um, I was really excited that you're here tonight because I had no idea and. Yeah, it's just really interesting that we're here and a few people have said maybe it was good karma, <laughs> which I hope it is, because yeah. um, my partner and I have driven across Australia a few times, oh. and every time we wanted to come see you in Western Australia, but we've never quite made it. Oh. Um, family and catching up and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought of something I wanted to ask you. It's something that we do, which is really funny. We have this thing where we say, trust me, when we've got something that we really want, to do mainly creative stuff. We say to each other, trust me, because we feel like you've really just got to trust me on this. It's going to be good. And I was wondering if there's anything like that that you advise people to say or do in their lives when you just know that something's on the right path? A lot of times, it's a very lovely question, you can feel you're on the right path. That's one of the reasons I said that statement, never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. Because if you get too much information, it confuses you. And instead you feel it. You feel in the heart what needs to be done. 
And I've trusted that so often in my life when people have given me these uh, questions about morality, what's the right thing to do? And often I say, well, you, you got enough information already, but how do you feel inside of you? What's the best thing for us to do? And then you actually usually discover that um, when what you trust is the best thing to do, it's always the best thing to do. And I just, on pertinent matters, say the, you know, the Newbury Buddhist Monastery and getting a retreat centre. You know, sometimes I've you know, committed myself to making sure that will happen, even though I'm not, sort of, don't live in Melbourne. I'm already doing more than enough. I've got a big retreat centre, a nuns monastery, a monks monastery, and goodness knows what else over in Western Australia, with so many monks and nuns to look after. And why am I doing this extra stuff? You feel it inside here, it needs to be done. And that's what I trust in, that intuition, which is much more powerful than logic. I know how to think logic, logically. I was a theoretical physicist. I could understand you know, quantum theory, and astrophysics. But you know, some of the moral decisions which people have to make, and sometimes they ask you for help in those choices. How do you do that? You feel it in here much more than just going on Wikipedia or on the internet and trying to find out more information. And this is what I really trust. And it's an emotional trust. A trust in goodness. A trust in this Newbury Buddhist monastery and the retreat centre. If I had looked at it, you know, how much was really needed? You know, when, when did we start? About three or four years ago? It was impossible. You know, it would be a crazy thing to start. But now we're so incredibly close. And that's amazing. Not only that, on last Monday, we did a, another bhikkhuni ordination. What do you see here? Two monks, three monks. Where are the nuns? Don't we have gender equity in Buddhism? For a long time, we didn't have any gender equity in Buddhism. When I see that, I think, that's not right. And I can't just sit there and blame others. I'm going to make sure that you do something about that and you make it happen. So, some years ago, about 13, 14 years ago, I did the first bhikkhuni ordination in Australia. I got into big trouble for that. I don't mind that. It's worthwhile doing. And now we have a community of Theravada, fully ordained nuns who can ordain others. And every time I see that happening, like on Monday, seeing one of the bhikkhunis at uh, NBM, Newbury, take the full ordination. That means something to me. That always grabs my emotional part of my being. Wow, it's happening, it's happened. This is the beginning of something which those of you in Melbourne should be very, 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 very proud of. You're doing something which is not in any other parts of Australia except for Perth. Fully ordained nuns, respected having ordination ceremonies, reinstating something which had been lost for Buddhism for centuries. And it's taking off in other countries of the world now. And to me that is trust. I have to trust myself. It's all going to work out all right. And my goodness, it has way beyond my expectations. That's the sort of stuff which don't take the easy way out and say, no, it can't be done, or other people say it can't be done. No, you have to stand your own ground and make it work. So that's what we do with bhikkhuni ordination. That's what we've done with NBM so far. And that's what we continue to do, to make the impossible work. What other people say can't be done, you say, why not? And you make it happen. Okay, so you get me.
Thank you. Be inspired now. Great answer. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. Um, yes. Sridjif is coming to give you the mic. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question, uh, Ajahn Brahm. Um, one of the uh, five precepts of uh, Buddhism is uh, not to harm anybody, not to harm any uh, sentient life. Yet, uh, I'm just wondering whether Buddhism do say anything about the, uh, what we call the voluntary assisted dying. That's oh, yeah. been, become a law almost all Australia now. Does Buddhism take a position on that uh, harm that uh, one do what to oneself? Uh, it's, it's a wonderful question simply because people have a conflict there. A conflict between compassion. If you've ever been with a person who's close to death and who's suffering greatly, it's one of the wonderful privileges a monk has. You're allowed to go in to the ICUs, into the bedsides of people who are suffering greatly. I remember this one gentleman, he was an Australian Caucasian Buddhist, had a terrible um, lung cancer, and he would ask me, please, Ajahn Brahm, can't you take me out of the back and have me shot? And this, he was not joking. He was suffering immensely, even though in an Australian hospital, with the best palliative care you can get, it wasn't working for him. And that sort of conflicted me. I would say fortunately, fortunately he died in a day or two later. But to see him suffering so much, if I saw you suffering that much, is that being compassionate to, to say, no, keep on going, keep your life going? But then again, you're not allowed to uh, terminate a person's life. So the answer is, that having done a lot of even research of what the Buddha said, Voluntary euthanasia is where you fully make the decision, not me. It's your choice. And the first person in Australia who ever took voluntary euthanasia, this was in the Northern Territory laws, and that was a man called Mr. Dent, D-E-N-T who happened to be a Buddhist. I never met him, but I met people who talked to him and knew him. He had one of these conditions. There was no reasonable hope of any survival. His body would be tormented for such a long time. He'd already endured a few years of that. But he said the main reason why he wanted to take voluntary euthanasia was to free his wife. His wife loved him so much, was his prime carer, and would not you know, let other people give her respite as much as she needed. She felt it was her duty and obligation to look after her husband. And he wanted to take this voluntary euthanasia out of compassion for her. So he took that voluntary euthanasia, where he was in total control of the whole process from beginning to end. When I actually saw that, had it explained to me, I think that is a totally different ball game than you knew deciding to kill somebody. There was so much compassion there that how can you blame that? And there were even cases in the suttas, like it was Venerable Channa, where he committed suicide. He was fully enlightened, and the Buddha said his death was blameless. So, the point is that in some circumstances, I do personally uh, believe that that should be allowable for people to make that choice with the safeguards that no one else is influencing you or forcing you at all. 
And it's similar to a, a similar problem which Buddhists have. Probably more likely you have, say, a dog and it's got cancer. And you take it to the vet and the vet said, I have to put your dog down. In other words, to euthanize it. What should you do? You cannot force that dog you know, to suffer so much, that doesn't feel right. But then can you kill that dog? And the answer is a beautiful one, and it's also it just ties into what I was saying about the voluntary euthanasia of a human being. That is a simple answer, if that is your dog, or cat, or something else which is a pet for you, ask it what it wants to do. Classic tale, this lady, she was one of our committee members in Perth, Judy, had a wonderful dog, she loved it to bits, took it to the vet, it had been had cancer, had treatment, really expensive treatment, she didn't matter how much it cost, someone you love. And then eventually the vet said, look, I have to inject your dog to euthanize it. It's suffering too much and there's no possibility of a cure. And she said, can I just have a minute with my dog, please, alone? And she followed my advice. She looked into her dog's eyes, which she'd loved for so many years, and asked the dog, do you want to die or carry on? If that's your dog, you know what it needs, what it wants. You got a very clear message back, the dog did not want to be euthanized. So she went back to the vet and said, no, I'm taking my dog home. And this vet scolded her, you Buddhists think you're compassionate and wise, you're being cruel and selfish, that dog is suffering. She said, I'm not I'm taking it home. Okay. She took the dog back to the vet six months later. It made a full recovery, all by itself. And when she took the dog back into the vet, the vet couldn't believe it had recovered. And the vet said, you Buddhists are so smart and so wise. <laughs> <laughs> don't just think that your, the views, the feelings of your dog or a cat don't matter. Of course they do. You ask them. You get the answer. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the questions I'm answering at length because they'll be excellent questions. Anyone else have any questions? Maybe one last question. Another one? Because we. Usually in Buddhism we do things in threes, that's only two questions so far. Yeah. So we should have a third question and we'll finish it off then maybe. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Yep. Um, do I have to stand up or...? I can really? see you, fine, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, um, good to see you again, Ajahn. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving a very Ajahn Brahm Dhamma talk. Um, yeah, like... For, for Melbournians like me, it's it's like attending an Arjun Brahm's talk. It's like celebrating our birthday. It happens uh, only once a year. And yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, so my question is: um, so I, I do suffer from um, depression and attention deficit disorder. Um, it it doesn't in, impact me um, impact on me all the time, but it does from time to time and what would you suggest people like me to do um, in the meantime I, I know it um, it's not permanent like th there's light at the end of the tunnel but um, in the meantime what do you suggest us to do um, yeah um, if, if possible second question um, no actually for, yeah just one question in there okay yeah the first of all just you know, to find ways of uh, lessening the causes for depression. And the cause of depression is when we get 
um, exposed to too much negativity outside of ourselves. This was, it's a story, and it's lovely to explain these things in stories. This is actually from the, the Buddhist teachings, from the Dhammapada, about this royal elephant who was the king's elephant. In those days, in the jungle, the best vehicle would be to get on the back of an elephant. It was high up, so you wouldn't get scratched you know, by all the bushes down below you. It was much safer, and the elephant could actually travel so well in the jungles and the mountains. So a good elephant was like the Rolls Royce you know, for the, uh, the royalty. So it had the king's elephant, and then for one reason or another, the king's elephant became very badly behaved. It would never do the right thing, would you know, squirt water at the king or poo when the, the trainer was right behind it. You know, there's a few times in Sri Lanka where we had these processions where I had to walk behind an elephant and that was really scary. <laughs> if that elephant passed wind, I would pass out. <laughs> but anyway, this royal elephant started to become really almost impossible. So the king just got the vets to check out on the elephant. The elephant was healthy. But then he got one of the ministers said, no, a Buddha in a previous life, leave it with me and I will sort of figure out what's going on. He wanted to gather more information, the causes why the elephant had changed its character. So he stayed all night by the elephant store, and that's when he heard a strange noise behind the elephant store. There was a gang of bad people would meet there every evening. And they'd discuss you know, who they were going to uh, kill or steal from, or what drugs they wanted to sell or whatever. Really a lot of bad people would meet there every evening. And this minister realized that was the cause for the elephant misbehaving. So he told the king, the king had those bad men arrested and asked the monks and the nuns to go there every evening to discuss Dhamma, do some chanting, meditate. And that was all that was needed for the elephant to change back into his old character, even better than he was before. Just association with good people. Which is one of the reasons why if you are depressed or anxious, don't just stay at home by yourself. Come and join you know, club societies like the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Go and help at Newbury. Go and volunteer at old people's homes or something. Do something which is good, uplifting and serving. Spend days you know, at Newbury Buddhist Monastery. You know, chatting with the monks, the nuns. And after a while, you know, the, you become more inspired and much better. You find there's a meaning in your life. And you find that the depression and anxiety vanish. That's one of the reasons why people... It works. I shouldn't say this, but sometimes they ask the the husband, just go and spend a week at monastery. And they come better, come back, a better husband. It's like you're sending your car to be tuned. <laughs> and it works. So I'm saying that association with good people really helps. It trains you to look at life in a totally different way. And the depression tends to disappear happened to many people. And also join the citizen if you're a young adult. Yes, yeah, citizen, yeah. Well, it's young, I'm really impressed with citizen, young, sort of really working hard, impressive young people. So, yeah, please join the citizen. But don't just join, just go along and help and just and mess around. You can see as a monk, you know, sometimes people think I should be more restrained. But when I give, you know, uh, blessings and chants, at the end of every talk, I do the three sadhus. And how do I do those three sadhus? I'm going to do it now. Yes.
How does that feel? Good. You get energy up and it's happiness. And things like that overcome depression. You think it's being silly. What's wrong with being silly if it cures depression? Okay. Okay, well, excellent. Thank you so much for the questions. And thank you, Ajahn Brahm. That was an inspiring talk. Um, we are also very, very grateful for you to join and participate at the BSV Vesak celebrations, starting from the fundraising event last Friday night, uh, the BSV MBM Vesak celebrations at MBM on Sunday, and finally, this time I talk today. So thank you so much, Ajahn. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.